So lastly, we have talked over there. We have seen a uh, differential pair consisting of uh, uh, these two MOS devices, M1 and M2, assuming that they are identical in nature, uh, sharing equal uh, threshold voltage, equal transconductance, everything being the same. And uh, we have uh, these two uh, drain resistor RD connected uh, to the supply line PDD. And you have this tail current source so that uh, uh, it can suppress any variation in the common mode level. Right. So that's why this tail current source was there. And accordingly, we have observed the corresponding uh, transfer characteristics. The large signal variation that means if my uh, V1 minus V2 that voltage, if, if it varies from extreme negative to extreme positive, right, from uh, say minus infinity to plus infinity, if V1 minus V2 varies like this, what the variation of this V out 1 minus V out 2? So, whenever we talk about uh, a differential pair or differential amplifier, that means my input is also differential. It's not a single V1 or V2, it's basically V1 minus V2, right? And similarly, when we uh, take the output, the output is not also single end gate. The output is basically the V out 1 minus V out 2. Right. So, in case of a differential amplifier or differential pair, what we have, we have the input as V1 minus V2 and output as V out 1 minus V out 2. Right. So, this V1 minus V2 can be regarded as the input for the differential pair and V out 1 minus V out 2 can be regarded as the output of the differential pair. And accordingly, uh, we have observed that the variation is something like that. Right. Basically, uh, what we have uh, considered last day, it was like uh, we have identified, okay, when V1 minus V2 is very, very less than zero, that means if it is very extremely negative, in that case, this uh, V out 1 minus V out 2 is uh, constant, that is ISSRD, right? And when V1 minus V2 is very, very greater than zero, extreme positive, then it is minus RD. And when V1 equal to V2, that means V1 minus V2 equal to zero, then it is zero. Right, so we have identified those three points: this, this region, this region, and this region. But we don't know what is there inside. This one, this one, I don't know. How does it vary? That, uh, I mean, this mathematical calculation we have not done last day, and that we have planned to uh, complete today. If you can remember the differential pair uh, involving VJT that you studied in the electronic circuits course, uh, hopefully you remember that variation is a tan hyperbolic nature, right? It's a tan hyperbolic nature, tan hyperbolic function. And for that case, uh, we have to check uh, what is the scenario for this MOS based differential amplifier. Because for the BJT, as you know, this current voltage relationship it follows this exponential nature, right? However, for MOS, you understand that when the MOS operates in the saturation region, it is basically a parabolic nature, right? So ID is equal to some constant multiplied with this overdrive voltage whole square. So therefore, we have to check whether it is uh, still it follows, hopefully, it will not follow that hyperbolic function, tan hyperbolic function then what kind of function it follows, we have to check. Right, so let's move to the mathematical part, okay. So that is a differential amplifier, right. And since I have already told you that uh, this particular current source, in fact we have a current source over there, a tail current source. Which can, this is a tail current source, let it be represented by ISS. And typically we model this current source by means of a MOS device. So that's why this M3, the third MOS is, is placed in this particular circuit. And then mm, this is the overall, overall circuitry, you have this M1, you have this M2, these are the two output nodes, I can call it like uh, say, say let it be say node X and node Y. And the supply uh, is there, uh, VDD, and uh, from the supply to this node X and node Y, the the drain resistors are there, RD. Now, whenever these two inputs, these two gates are connected together, gate 1 and gate 2, that means we are considering the, the common mode behavior, right? V in CM. So, your input uh, consists of the common mode part as well as the differential part. So, input is nothing but, I mean, if I consider this input V in 1 over there and V in 2 over there, so they form, together they form a differential pair. That means they share common uh, DC level, fixed DC level, and the variation of this V1 and V2 over time is equal and opposite. Right, if you can remember. Last we have noticed this one, something like that. Yes. This is the... Uh, 
corn modeler then one variation is something like that and the other variation is like this so this is a common mode level fixed common mode level identified by this red line and this blue corresponds to if, if blue corresponds to uh, this green one then the green corresponds to green two equal and opposite expression that means they together form a differential pair differential signal right okay so now suppose let's let's uh, now let's vary this uh, v in cm this input common mode level from zero on Let's start, it, let's start it from zero, not from negative, let's start it from zero. Now what happens if, uh, okay, uh, these are the NMOS uh, with some uh, finite uh, non-zero threshold voltage, VTH, non-zero threshold voltage, maybe 0.2 volt, 0.3 volt, 0.4 volt. Now what happens when uh, this V in 1 and V in 2, both of them, I mean, they are the common mode level, input common mode level equal to zero. What do you expect? Obviously it will be off. It should be off. And if it is off, both of them are off, so therefore there is no current flowing. I t1 equal to I t2 equal to zero. But surprisingly, here we have a current source present over here, so we can model this current source by means of this MOS M3, who is having some voltage, VB. And we are, we are assuming that this VB is large enough so that the inversion layer is created, channel is created. The, the MOS M3 is on, the VB is large. Large enough, I mean, VB is greater than the threshold voltage of MOS 3, and we can also assume that these three MOS they are having the same threshold voltage, all of them are in MOS. So, VB is greater than VTH. So, the device is on, but there is no current flowing. Device is on, but there is no current flowing. Mean, meaning what? That means the drain source voltage, okay, it is in a deep triad region. It is in a deep triad region. The gate voltage is large, the drain voltage is, is small, and it is in a deep triad region. Right? It is in deep triad region, so there is no current flowing. Now, when uh, this V in CM exceeds the threshold voltage, in that case, you expect that the current starts flowing. Current starts flowing, right? Then what will be the status of uh, these two MOS devices? M1, M3, and obviously M3. Initially, the M3 was in deep trial. It was in deep trial. That means this this potential is almost close to this potential is almost close to zero, very small, right? Now, as this input, uh, obviously, it, it will be there. As long as your uh, this VNCM is less than threshold voltage, VTH. Now, when VNCM exceeds the threshold voltage, then these two MOS devices, M1 and M2, they will be on, and they will carry some current, right? And obviously, as you increase the uh, the VNCM value beyond threshold voltage, beyond VTH, the current will also increase because it is having more uh, uh, your gate drive, more overdrive voltage. Current will also increase, and ultimately, uh, obviously, this M3 will come out from the deep uh, deep triode, and it will now it will be in the triode region, right? Because this voltage is constant for the MOS M3. Gate voltage is constant, and basically, when the M1 M2 it is becoming on, so this particular potential uh, oh I have represented it to be Vx, so it is it is better to call it uh, giving some other name, say let it be Vp, not X. Let me give the name Vp. Okay, so as uh, uh, as the VNCM uh, exceeds the threshold voltage, uh, these two MOS devices M1 and M2 they will be on, and uh, this VP basically it will follow this particular gate potential. And ultimately, what happens is M3 will come out from the deep triode and it will be in the triode region. And one point will come when VNCM is large enough. One point will come when this this voltage, this voltage VP is greater than the overdrive voltage of M3. What is the overdrive voltage? That is constant. VB minus VTH. That is constant because we are not we are not varying this VB. VTH is also constant, but this VP will increase as we increase this V in one, or rather V in two or V in CM because V in one and V in two they are connected together in the common mode operation. So point will come when VP exceeds the overdrive for M3. Then what happens is M3 enters into the saturation. Now, once M3 enters into the saturation, that means now we have a constant current flowing through this. And this constant current will be shared equally by both of these two transistors, both of these two MOS. Right. So, that is the minimum value. That is the minimum value for your uh, input common mode level. Because then what happens? Both of these two transistors, M1, M2, M3, all of them, they will be there in the 
saturation ratio. Then what is the requirement? What is the minimum compound level value then? What is the minimum VNCM value which is required for that? No. If it is if it is VTH, then obviously now this M3 will be there in the triode region. It will carry some current. But what is our objective? To make all these three transistors M1, M2, M3 to operate in the saturation. Right? In saturation. So therefore, what I can write here, so this one, uh, this V in CM, what is that? V in CM is basically your, I can call it like VGS1 plus VGS1, here to here you have VGS1 plus you have VDS3, VGS1 plus VDS3. Right? What is the minimum value for this VDS3? So that all three, M1, M2, M3 will be there in the saturation. What is the minimum value for VDS3? That is VGS3 minus VTS3. Isn't it? Minus VTS3. Is it okay? So therefore, when VNCM exceeds this value, VGS1 plus VGS3 minus VTS3, then you expect that, obviously, the M1, M2, M3, all of these three transistors will be there in the saturation region. So that is the minimum value for this input on mode level. That is the minimum value. Right? Then what happens as you go on uh, increasing this uh, input convert level? Can you increase it indefinitely? What do you feel? That is the minimum value as I told you. VGS1, it should be greater than VGS1 plus VGS3 minus VGS3. Clear? This one? This one? VGS1 plus VGS3 minus VGS3. Clear? Then, in doubt, in doubt, no. So that's the minimum value. So can I can I increase it indefinitely? <coughs> can I increase this uh, this one indefinitely? <laughs> you feel? When this, when, when uh, this M1, M2, M3, all of the saturation, and basically the current is ISS. So what is the current uh, measured by M1 and M2 each? This is nothing but ISS by two. So therefore, so if it is, if this point is X and this point is Y, then what is Vx in saturation? Vx is equal to Vy. That is equal to VDT minus ISS by 2 times Rb. <coughs> when all these three transistors are in saturation. <coughs> but what you are doing, you are increasing the common mode level of M1 and M2. Right? So drain voltage is held at a constant value. That is uh, VDD minus ISS by 2 times Rb. Right? But you are increasing the gate voltage. So point will come when this condition VGS minus VTH less than VTS will not be satisfied. Right, so that is the maximum value. So you can have this equal to or uh, VGS minus VTH equal to VDS under extreme condition. So under extreme condition, what do you have? VGS one minus VTH is equal to VX or VXS. I can write or I can also write like VG is equal to VX plus VTH. Right. When the gate voltage equal to plus threshold voltage, when the gate voltage equal to drain voltage plus threshold voltage, that signifies the maximum gate voltage that you can have. That signifies the maximum uh, common mode voltage that you can have. Beyond this point, what happens? Your drain voltage is fixed, VDD minus uh, half uh, ISSRD. 
but gate voltage increases, then this M1, M2 will move into the triad region. So therefore, this is the maximum value of this uh, input uh, common mode level. So, uh, so, so there is a there is a range for this input common mode level. You cannot have any arbitrary value from zero to two VDD. You can have, you, you must be having some some range. So, what is that range? So, this range is identified by this entire thing. It should be the minimum value is VTS one plus VTS three minus VTS three. That is the minimum value. So that all three transistors M one, M two, M three, they enter into the saturation. They are in the saturation. Initially, M one, M two, they are they are in the off condition. When the uh, input common mode level is, is equal to zero or negative, and your M3 was in uh, deep trial, then as uh, this VNCM increases, M3 will come out of the trial region. It will be in the come out of from the from the uh, deep trial. It will be in the trial region, and uh, it will be having some current through M1 and M2. But still, these two transistors M1 and M2 they are in the cut of uh, your uh, trial region, not inside. So, what is the minimum value for this VNCM, which ensures that all three transistors M1, M2, M3 in the saturation, that is the minimum value. VGS1 plus VGS3 minus VGS3, that is the minimum value. And when VNCM is up to this point, VDD minus uh, IS is by 2 by RT plus VTH, then that is the maximum value up to which all three transistors will be there in the saturation. So, whenever you are applying this VNCM, so you should remember that particular range of this VNCM. So, if VNCM is greater than this one, this VNCM minimum and less than VNCM maximum, then all three transistors will be there in the saturation and that is the region of operation for your case. Right? Okay. Now, we have this uh, detailed mathematical calculation what we are expecting to complete today. Okay. There are a lot more mathematics, but nothing to worry about. So, okay, this is a large signal. So, today we will discuss only the large signal characteristics. That means we are allowing the input signal to vary from very negative to extreme uh, positive, extreme negative to extreme positive, from minus to plus infinity. We have done the same thing last day, but qualitatively, right? And today we will observe the same thing quantitatively by using some mathematics from them. So, what I get. Okay, so if I call this point, as I already mentioned, say let this point be point P over here. So I can write this uh, Vp at point P, the voltage equal to V in 1 minus Vgs1. If you look from this side, if you look from this side, it's nothing but V in 1 minus Vgs1. And if you look from this side, this is V in 2 minus Vgs2. So Vp is equal to v, VGS, uh, v, in, v in 1 minus Vgs1 equal to V in 2 minus Vgs2. So therefore, you can write Vn1 minus Vn2 is equal to Vgs1 minus Vgs2. It's quite obvious. And since now we have to restrict our ourselves that okay, uh, that uh, the input common mode level that we are talking about, that input common mode level must be such that these all three all these two transistors M1 and M2 must be there in the saturation. So therefore, that is the expression for the current current and voltage. I is equal to half mu and C ox W over L into Vgs minus Vth whole square. I have just neglected the channel and modulation there. That nature, this uh, I mean uh, V out minus V out 2 versus V in 1 minus V in 2. Differential output versus differential input. Last day we have calculated, we have just observed qualitatively, intuitively have identified what should be the maximum value, what should be the minimum value, what is the condition under equilibrium when V not equal to V in 2, when there is no differential signal, only the convert signal is present, then what is the value, what is the output voltage? that should be 0, ideally it should be 0. Right, that we have done last day. Quantitative discussion. Today we will do the same thing quantitatively using mathematics. <laughs> so that's why we will be also we will be also able to find out the nature of that particular graph. Okay. So uh, since uh, since uh, it is equal to this one half mu and C ox W over L into VGS minus VTH whole square, so I can write VGS is equal to square root of twice it upon mu and C ox W over L plus VTH. So now if you just uh, simply Substitute this value over there, V in 1 minus V in 2, that is equal to VGS1 minus VGS2. So you just substitute these values, and since the threshold voltage is the same, so that gets cancelled. And what we have? Uh, v in 1 minus V in 2 is equal to square root of twice ID1 mu and C ox W over L minus uh, square root of twice ID divided by mu and C ox W over L. And uh, as you know, V out minus ID1 RT 
and V out is given by infinity minus I D two continuous. So I have used different I D I D one I D two because if if they are having the same common mode level, I mean the same same DC level. I mean if if I can tie these two together, these two get hold this together. In that case, you have the same current. Otherwise, if I if I allow, okay, the input can be having. I mean I can also consider, okay, this is my point of observation over here and over here. So when the V in one is extreme positive, V in two is extreme negative. Differential pair. In that case, you don't expect that ID one and ID two they are same. But the condition, but the situation is that ID one plus ID two that is equal to ISS. The summation is equal to ISS. Okay, so that's why I can have the different value for ID one and different value for ID two. So obviously, V out one minus V out two is given by uh, ID two minus ID one times RT. DC. No, DC. we are performing last signal analysis. Don't get confused that the last signal is equal to the DC analysis. It's not like that. Last signal means what? We are allowing the input to vary from extreme negative to extreme positive. And here, what is the input? Here, input is not V one and V two separately. Here, input is V one minus V two. Right. So, last signal means we are allowing the input to vary. Is V one minus V two to vary from minus to plus input? When it is equal to zero, then only you are considering the DC analysis. That means V not equal to V. Okay, so V out one minus V out two is equal to this much. I D two minus I D one times R T. <laughs> Don't get afraid of this one. This expression. V in one minus V in two. Already you have got the square root of this one twice I D one by this minus twice I D two by this. Squaring both sides, what we get? This one twice I D one. By this, twice I D two by this minus this one. Okay, a minus the whole square. Twice I D one by this. Let, let it be k. Let it be k. This is also k. So I D one plus I D two is I S S. Okay. So therefore, it is twice I S S upon mu one C of W bar L. Okay. So V uh, one minus V two whole square. Simple a minus b whole square formula. S square plus b square minus y square b. So we have got this one twice I S S by mu one C of W over L minus four square root of I D one I D two upon mu one C of W over L. Then you have another square root. So you can once again simplify this one. You can keep this twice uh, square root of I D one I D two in one side. The rest part in the other side, right? Once again, you square this one. You square this one. A minus B whole square. Four I D one I D two this side. This is obviously this one, one by four mu one C of W over L whole square, V one minus V two whole to the power four plus I S square minus this one A minus B whole square. <laughs> Now we have four I D one I D two. That means four A B. Four A B is given by because ultimately what we are interested in, we are interested in finding out del V out and del V in. That means V out one minus V out two and V in one minus V in. Right, V out one minus V out two, the differential output. V in one minus V two, that is differential input. Okay, and you know that V out one minus V out two can also be written as a function of I D one minus I D two, or minus I D one minus I D two. Okay, so that's why we are always trying to find out in the, I mean, the that particular form, either I D one minus I D two, or V out one minus V out two, or V in one minus V in two in that particular form, not V in one plus V in two. And we know that I D one plus I D two is equal to I S S. So that's why four A B is given by A plus B whole square minus A minus B whole square. So I D one plus I D two whole square minus I D one minus I D two whole square is equal to this much. Okay. This is I S square. This is I D one minus I D two whole square. One by four B one C X W by L whole square. V in one minus V in two whole to the power four plus I S square. I S square gets cancelled. Minus this one. Right. Ultimately. What you are getting, that expression I D one minus I D two whole square is equal to one by four mu one C of W by L whole square V in one minus V in two whole square, and then four I S S by mu one C of W by L minus V in one minus V in two whole square. It's a big expression, right? It's a big expression, but it is having some meaning inside. Okay, so then. Let me represent this. Okay, del I D is equal to I D one minus I D two, and del V is equal to V one minus V two. So that it looks uh, a compact one. This expression. Yeah.
so far. Ultimately, we have got this expression. Now, this is the expression of our interest. This expression. This expression. This one. Delta ID is equal to half mu 1 C ox W over L multiplied with delta V in multiplied with square root of 4 ISS upon mu 1 C ox W over L minus delta V in square. What is the implication? So that is the mathematical form we have already got. So what is the implication of this particular expression? The first thing is that this delta ID, this delta ID is an odd function of delta V. Is an odd function of delta v. That means, as you have, <coughs> so what is your delta v? V1 minus V2. V1 minus V2. Half mu and C of W model multiplied with delta v. Multiplied with square root of 4 ISS, mu and C of W model minus delta v in square. So we have got this expression, del i t is equal to some constant multiplied with del v, multiplied with 4 ISS upon some constant minus del v in square. Now out of this, so there are parameters, now out of this, you understand that, uh, okay, this is a constant part, half mu and c of w over l. This is constant. This one is also constant. So what I can write, write that uh, this delta i t, <coughs> as some constant, so let it be k1 times delta v in times square root of <coughs> k2 minus delta v in square. <coughs> so we are interested in finding out the variation of this delta id with respect to delta v in. Okay. So there are two contradictory dependence. First one is here we find that delta i t is some constant multiplied with delta v. So as delta v increases, it seems that delta i t will also increase. Right? In, in the second case, what you find? Delta i t is some, some constant is there, k1 delta v multiplied with square root of k2 minus delta v square. So if you just observe the square root of k2 minus delta v square, it seems that only in isolation, if you just observe the square root of k2 minus delta v square in isolation, then it seems that as delta v increases, as delta v increases, this factor drops. So in one case you find that as delta v increases, delta id increases. In other case you find that as delta v increases, this delta id drops. Then the question is that which one is going to dominate out of these two? Right? Then you have already noticed that while we have performed this qualitative discussion last day, that delta v out versus delta v. What was the nature? I started today also, this one, this nature, this nature, right? What is the nature? It is something like that. That was the nature. That means when delta v is large enough, when delta v is large enough, this is constant, or small enough, right? That means what? Constant means what? If you just consider the mod of this, that is the maximum value, no? That is the maximum value. So here, this v out 1 minus v out 2, and as you know, v out 1 minus v out 2 can be regarded as some constant multiplied with your uh, id1 minus id2, your rd there only, right. So as your delta v increases, if it is very large, then what happens? Out of two transistors, m1 and m2, one transistor will be in the saturation, <laughs> it will carry this entire ISS current, and the other transistor will be cut off. That means it will not, it will not carry any current. That means under this condition, when V1 minus V2 is large enough, then delta ID is also large, that is a maximum possible value, large enough. If V1 is much, much greater than V2, then ID1 should be much, much greater than ID2, that is equal to uh, ISS, that is a maximum. On the other hand, if V1 is much, much less than V2, then the entire current will be carried by 
uh, uh, MOS M2 only. In that case, ID1 is equal to 0 and ID2 is equal to ISS. So, as data increases, data ID will also increase. Right? Then, if I once again come back to this expression over here, yes. Over here, so ultimately what I find that uh, this particular factor dominates. So the way this delta V increases and the way this, this entire thing reduces, the first thing is dominant over the second factor. So overall, this delta ID will increase with respect to delta V. Right? Then, delta ID can be equal to 0 also. What is the meaning of delta ID equal to 0? What is the physical significance? That means, both of them are carried equal. That means, delta ID. Delta ID means what? ID1 minus ID. Delta ID 0 means, both of, both of the transistors M1 and M2, they are carrying equal current, same current. So, one second you have two parameters, let me one second write it down. So, it is something like that, delta ID is given by some constant K1 times delta V in multiplied with K2 times delta V in square. So, delta ID can be 0 if delta V is equal to 0 or the square root K2 minus delta V square is equal to 0. So, delta V is equal to 0 means what? V0 equal to V. That is quite obvious. That means your differential pair is in equilibrium condition, under equilibrium condition. So, when V1 is equal to V2, as you have noticed, uh, that graph that we have considered, if it is delta V in, then this is the point, no? And suppose this is delta I. When V1 is equal to V2, that means delta V is equal to 0, then delta I is equal to 0. That means both of them are carrying equal current, that is equal to ISS by 2. Right? So, this is also satisfied? Yes or no? If delta V is equal to 0, then delta V has to be 0. That means the device, I mean this entire pair is, is under equilibrium condition. And we are considering the DC analysis only. That is one thing. Right? The second part is very important. Second part says that when K2 is equal to delta V in square, right? When K2 is equal to delta V in square, then also there is a chance that this uh, delta ID is equal to 0, that means ID1 is equal to ID2. But you have not experienced this one. Have you experienced this one? No. You have observed that the graph is something like that. The graph is something like that. Right? So therefore, if K2 is equal to delta V square, that means from where you are getting delta V is equal to 2 square root of ISS upon 4 mu uh, uh, mu of W bar L. Theoretically, it says that, mathematically, it says that if delta V is equal to that value, 2 square root of ISS upon 4 mu uh, of W bar L, then there is a chance that uh, they are, they are both of these two transistors, they share equal current. But practically, it is not happening. Right? So, where, where lies the fallacy? The question is that where lies the fallacy? K2 is equal to, I mean, uh, if, uh, and from this particular equation, it says that, it says that if delta V in, if delta V in is equal to 2 square root of ISS by mu n C ox W over L, then it seems that delta ID is equal to 0, mathematically. Isn't it? If you go by the mathematics, then it, it is something like that. But you have never experienced while observing this large signal characteristics qualitatively. Last we have done this qualitative analysis. Now, obviously, this delta v, delta ID is equal to 0 when delta V is equal to 0. That is validated. But you never experience that delta ID will be equal to 0 when delta V is equal to this much, twice of this is upon mu and C of W. So the thing is that where lies the fallacy? 
पहले ही बना लेते To answer this question, let's do another thing. Let's uh, find out the overall transconductance of the differential pair, right? Sir, I simply put another connector. Typical in the range of uh, milli ampere. Yes, sir. Typical in the range of milli ampere. Sir, the delta between both of them, I mean, below or below? No, typically it is cold. Typically cold. But for large and large thing analysis, we are allowing, na? We are allowing the delta V to vary. Okay. Now let's uh, find out the the transconductance. Transconductance of the differential pair, right? So delta I D is your uh, differential output current, and delta V is the differential input voltage. So what is the transconductance? What should be the formula? It's nothing but delta del del I D upon del del V. Because this del I D, this is your Output current for the differential pair and del V in is the input voltage for the differential pair. For the differential pair, the input is not V in one or V in two alone. The input is V in one minus V in two. The output is not V out one or V out two alone. Output is V out one minus V out two. Or I can also write I D one minus I D two. So this V V in one minus V in two is represented by delta V in, and V out one or I D one minus I D two is represented by delta I D. So this is your output. This is your output. For differential pair, this is your input for the differential pair. So del of out, del of this output upon del of this input will give you the gain, and this is the different. Obviously, this is gm. That means the transconductance because it is current versus voltage and output versus input. So transconductance. So how to get this? Del I D. I have already got this expression for uh, delta I D. Delta I D is equal to some constant in delta V uh, multiplied with four I S S by some constant minus delta V square. So if you now Differentiate this uh, with respect to the delta V. Then ultimately, what we are getting, we are getting this expression. G M is equal to G M is equal to this expression. G M is equal to half V minus C of W over L multiplied with four I S S minus uh, four I S S by V minus C of W over L minus twice delta V square divided by this entire thing. Right. With delta v is equal to zero, what does it mean? The device, I mean this entire pair, is under equilibrium condition. Under which case you have got the GM to be square root of mu and C ox W over L into I S S. That means if you put delta v is equal to zero, then what happens? You have this is vanished, this is vanished. So you have only four, four by two, four by two. That is two, two and half gets cancelled. Only you have. Square root of mu and C of W over L into I S S. Right. Here also you find that if this entire factor is equal to if this entire factor is equal to zero, then also G M drops to zero. Then also G M drops to zero. What is that value? What is that value? What is that? We have two delta V square is equal to four I S S upon V minus zero W over L. That means the same that that previous value that we have got, na? That value is nothing but delta V in if delta V in is equal to two minus two over two. Two over two is two. Ah, this time we have two I S S upon V minus zero W over L. Last time what we got, so when this is equal to delta V is equal to this much, then it implies <coughs> G M to be zero, right? No, you just consider the numerator. No, no, we are not the principal denominator zero. Which one is larger? The denominator. The denominator is larger. So obviously, uh, as you uh, increase this one, as you increase this V in, so obviously this particular thing. Is smaller as compared to this one, right? So if delta V is equal to square root of twice I S S upon V N C of W over L, then G M is equal to zero. And last time, what we obtained, if delta V in is equal to two square root of 
ISS by BNC of W or L, then it seems that delta ID is equal to zero. Which one is larger? We have got one value over there. Let it be say delta V in one. Or let me have some different name. Let me call delta V in dash. Let me call delta V in double dash. Let me give some two different name. When delta V dash is equal to this square root of twice I S S upon mu N C of W over L, then G M was equal to zero. From this expression only. From this expression only. If this is equal to zero, that means G M equal to zero. That means two I S delta V in square is equal to four I S S by mu N C of W over L, or delta V is equal to square root of twice I S S mu N C of W over L. Last time. In the expression of delta ID, you have that factor. If you can remember, mu n c of w over l into delta v into that factor. From where, if delta v is equal to delta v square is equal to this one, then delta ID was zero. For which delta v in double dash is equal to twice of this one. Now, which one is larger, delta v in dash or delta v in double dash? Delta v in double dash is larger, right? So when The input is equal to when the input difference is equal to square root of twice I S S by mu N C of W over L. That means what? It signifies that G M is equal to zero. G M zero means what? G M zero means what? That means even if you change the V in input, there is no change in the output. There is output. There is no change in the output. G M is what? G M zero means what? G M zero means what? G M zero means if you change the delta V in But there is no change in delta i. What is the significance? The significance is that the one transistor is driven into the saturation, the other transistor is driven into the cutoff, so that the entire current is carried by one of one transistor. If V1 is greater than V2, then the transistor, I mean M1 will carry the entire current. If V2 is greater than V1, then M2 will carry the entire current. But the bottom line is that if delta V in dash or delta V is equal to delta V in dash, that is equal to twice I S S by mu N C of W over L square root. Then one transistor will carry this entire current, and the other transistor will carry no current. That means if you if you calculate this delta I D, del of delta I D, that is becoming zero, right? So beyond this point, so when you vary, suppose this is your delta V in axis, this is your delta V in axis, it starts from zero. First, it will reach this point, that is. Uh, Delta V in dash, and then it will reach this point. Delta V in double dash. So at zero particular point, both of these two transistors they share equal current. That means the device is under equilibrium condition, DC condition, right? As you increase this delta V from zero onwards, a point will come when delta V is equal to delta V in dash. This value, then one transistor will carry the entire current. And the other transistor will carry no current, right? Or, or, or I can write that okay, this is delta V in dash or modulus of this. Either V one minus V two or V two minus V one. If this one is equal to delta V in dash, then it signifies that one transistor will carry the entire current, the other transistor will carry no current, right? And then beyond this point, the analysis that we have made previously, this analysis was made under the assumption. That both of these two transistors, you can remember the expression for this current and I mean VGS and uh, this ID. How have we written this VGS? VGS is equal to square root of twice ID upon mu N C of W over L plus VTH. So that expression was written under this assumption that both of these two transistors are operated in the saturation. <laughs> and from where we have arrived at that particular expression. But remember, when delta V exceeds this value, when delta V exceeds this delta V in dash. Then one transistor is saturation is in saturation, the other transistor is in is in uh, cut off, and this delta V in double dash is obtained beyond delta V in dash after delta V in dash is present. Okay, so therefore you cannot reach at this point, or even if you reach at this point at that particular time, it is not true that both of these two transistors are in saturation at this particular point. One at least, in fact, at this particular point, one transistor. 
has been driven into the saturation and other times is in cut off. So, in this particular region over here, over here, I cannot say that both of them are in saturation. And we have derived at that particular expression delta i is equal to uh, k1 delta v in square root of k2 minus delta v square. That expression was obtained under the assumption that both of these two transistors are in saturation. And this is true over this region only. So, both of them are in saturation over, over this region from here to here. Both of them are in saturation. And beyond this point, one transistor is in saturation, the other transistor is in cut off. So, although we have obtained that expression mathematically, but that expression is not valid beyond this point. This expression is valid only up to this point. Right? And if you draw now, if you draw the uh, variation of this GM, so obviously, as you can see, under equilibrium condition, uh, we have got this GM that is equal to square root of mu and C of W over L times ISS. And if you now find out, okay, I have called this one as delta V in star. This delta V in dash is renamed as delta V in star. So, how does uh, this particular uh, GM vary with delta V? This is the variation of this GM with respect to delta V. The maximum value is obtained when delta V is equal to 0 and then ultimately drops down to 0 when delta V is equal to delta V in star. That means this value. That means this value. When this entire thing becomes 0. When this entire thing becomes 0. <coughs> that is equal to v, uh, delta V is equal to square root of twice ISS by mu and C of W over L. Right? So, as I have told you, so how does this uh, variation, I mean how can you observe this variation, this one, this variation from here to here? Which form? Hmm? Is it an H? Is it an H? No. How does it vary? We have already got this expression. No, we have already got this expression now. Delta I V. Delta I T is equal to some constant K1 delta V in times square root of K2 minus delta V in square. And this uh, V out 1 minus V out 2 is what? Yeah, as you understood, V out 1 is equal to VDD minus ID RD1. As you know, V out 1 is equal to VDD minus ID1 times RT. And V out 2 is equal to VDD minus ID2 times RT. So therefore, V out 1 minus V out 2 is equal to ID2 minus ID1 times RT. That means I can write like minus delta ID times RT. So, is it linear? Is it linear? Ah. Close to the origin, it is linear. Tan inverse. Tan is function. Tan is. How can you say it's a tan is function? It's a pro function or tan is function. Which function? This one. Delta i, no, that is the formula, na? Delta i is equal to some constant delta v in square root of k2 minus delta v in square. Is it a tan function? Tan hyperbolic function? Is it a tan hyperbolic function? What is your call? Is it a tan hyperbolic function? Do you have any exponential nature there? How tan hyperbolic function is defined? How is it defined? Tan hx, how is it defined? e to the power x minus e to the power minus x by e to the power x plus e to the power x. So, you do not have an e to the power function there. I have told you na, that uh, for uh, your BJT, hyperdense transistor, the formula was, I mean, our current versus voltage, that relationship was an exponential relationship. It is equal to another zero, we have IC. IC is equal to IS, then e to the power. P V by V minus one exponential nature. And when for your MOS, whereas for your MOS device, it is following this parabolic nature. 
I is equal to some constant multiplied with Vgs minus Vt equals. <coughs> okay. So this ends our discussion on large signal characteristics, large signal behavior of differential pair, and next day we will move into the small signal characteristics of differential pair.